it's a pretty interesting time to be talking about volatility. And what I want to do is give you a lot of different uh, ways of thinking about it and show you some, uh, some pictures of how things have evolved and what's going on. But I'd like to start at the beginning with the idea that what we're really interested in is risk. And what do we mean by a risk? Well, risk is some future event, some future event which is bad, but it might or might not happen. Some risks we can avoid completely, but many risks are worth taking. And that's what finance is all about, which risks are worth taking and which risks are not worth taking. This is actually a topic that's been studied for years and years and, in fact, is uh, subject of quite a few Nobel Prizes. Uh, Markowitz and Sharp and Tobin all received Nobel Prizes for recognizing that if you think about risk as being volatility, that we can get, make some progress on this question of which risks are worth taking. And the answer is very familiar to us. It's, uh, it goes by the fancy name of the capital asset pricing model. But basically, it says it's not worth taking uh, non-diversified risks. In other words, we all ought to hold diversified portfolios. We ought to spread our, our, our stocks over many different uh, companies. And if we don't do that, we're taking risks that we're not likely to be rewarded for. So that's a pretty simple answer. It's a pretty uh, powerful but simple theory. And it relates variances to risk. More recently, Black and Scholes and Merton, or actually it was just Scholes and Merton received the Nobel Prize because Fisher Black passed away be beforehand, can created the same kind of argument based on options prices because an option is like an insurance policy. And so the question of how volatile the stock market is is a question of what does it cost to insure it? And so an option gives you the answer to that question. And we just heard that when volatility is high, uh, it costs a great deal to ensure uh, the, your portfolio that it won't go down. And so this is a, a, a second way of thinking about risk in terms of volatility. Now it turns out when practitioners <coughs> try to implement these models, they recognize what is probably not too surprising. They recognize that volatilities were not actually constant. They seem to change over time. You had to actually estimate them. You, in business school, they tell you what the volatility is, and you have to calculate the options price. But in reality, we have to figure it out. So what we observe is that volatilities are changing over time. What we'd really like to know is what is the volatility now, or even more interesting is what is it going to be in the future? How do we predict future volatility? And when we think about that, the question is, how do we predict something that we don't actually ever really observe? Can we, can we uh, formulate that as a real problem? And that's, in fact, the problem that the ARCH model is designed to solve. The ARCH model is what stands for autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity. And so you can see why we call it the ARCH model, right? Because <laughs> you wouldn't want to have to go through all that. Only if you're a PhD student, you really have to be able to, uh, to, to spit that out. And what the ARCH model does is it relies on two important features of stock market data, or of financial data. One is volatility clustering, and the other is mean reversion of volatility. And what these are saying is that when we have high volatility, it comes in bunches. And when we have low volatility, it stays typically low for a while. And yet, when it's high, it only stays high for a while and then declines. So these two features tell us that there is some predictability in volatility, both that it's likely to stay high for a while and that it's likely eventually to go back down again. So the ARCH model is an extraordinarily simple model which embodies these two characteristics and can be calibrated to any kind of uh, series you look at. What does this model actually do anyway? <laughs> we can think about this ARCH model as a way of trying to form a confidence interval for what the stock market is going to do tomorrow. And here is a picture where the red line is what the stock market did 
every day since 1990. And the blue and green lines are GARCH predictions for what the what three standard deviations would be if it goes up and three standard deviations down. So it's the sense everything in there is less than a three sigma event. And what you see most obviously is that these confidence bands are changing over time. That there was a period in the middle between 98 and, and 2002 when the volatility was high and before that it was much lower during the, the middle 90s and it returned to a very low level in the middle 2004 to 2007. And you see on the right hand side this confidence band is starting to grow again. If you know what value at risk is, the bottom green curve is more or less the value at risk that, that companies and stock desks use to calculate the risk of their portfolio falling more than, uh, than three standard deviations or, or, or uh, uh, a number closely related to that. So it's changing over time. It turns out that, of course, that there were th some three sigma events over this sample period, uh, but not, not too many, and maybe more than you would expect for a normal distribution, but not more than you would expect for a, a fat tail distribution like a student T. But the thing that we'd like to know today, of course, is does this thing work through the more turbulent times that we've had recently. So what I've done here is I've estimated the model through 2004, which is a low volatility period. And then holding those parameters fixed, you can update these confidence bands every day. You observe the next day's return, and you update it for the next one, and you move forward. So when we do that, we can ask, now do we see some of these many, many sigma events. And so the picture looks rather different. This is all out of sample now. We're looking forward at what this, these confidence bands look like. And you see the dramatic effect that the confidence bands were very small through uh, the first part of this period from 2000, this is 2005, 2006, to the summer of 2007. And the summer of 2007 in August is when the first real evidence of uh, rising volatility and turbulence and the world was not the same as it was before occurred and the bands got wider and wider and then we got to the fall of 2008 and they shot up. However, if you look at this, of course, you'll see that there aren't many places where we were surprised in our confidence bands. There are very few three sigma events in this forecast period, even though the model is estimated only up through 2004. In fact, if you want to see what they are, we should look at the ratio of the return to its standard deviation. And here's the histogram of that. And what you see is that the maximum was actually one three sigma event. The minimum, however, was a seven and a half sigma event. So that was, that's really pretty big. There is excess kurtosis. But other than that, it looks sort of a uh, reasonable shape. If you look at the picture, you see where is the seven and a half sigma event? And the answer is it's early 2007. It's not after the volatility has gone up, it's before. And those of you who manage money probably recognize this event, but most of the rest of you probably don't. This turns out to be the day, this is February 27th, it turns out to be the day that the Chinese raised the transactions tax on the Shanghai Stock Exchange. And the entire world financial markets collapsed, but it was very temporary, it went back up again. But this was a very big event compared to the volatility that was, we were experiencing at that time. So that's why this turned out to be a very extreme event, but all the stuff in here in 2007, 2008 was well modeled by this uh, very simple little model.